This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of February 19th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, We explain why we believe the Permanent Fund Board is becoming increasingly politicized and needs to be restructured. Second, we explain why we agree with Larry Persily about the huge problems being created for this generation, but even more importantly for future generations, by the Dunleavy administration's proposal effectively to deplete the CBR. And third, we explain why the Senate's proposed government pension bill is both a disingenuous and financially dangerous pig in a poke. And now, let's join Michael. Let's get started. We're going to start off with a story that I actually got into yesterday. Um, And it is the Permanent Fund Board is becoming more and more political. They're not going to let a crisis go to waste. And there's a piece in the ADN that talks specifically about this James Brooks over at the Alaska Beacon writes about it. Um, so they're, they've got a study. They've got a warning. We're going to run out of money if you don't do what we tell you to do. Give us the uh, give us the rundown here. Yeah, after having drained the earnings reserve by $8 billion to move it over prematurely over to the uh, over to the corpus and then and telling everybody at the time they're doing that we're doing it to advance pay. Uh, inflation proofing, but now they seem to have forgotten that it's just eight billion dollars over and in the corpus. And oh my God, the earnings reserve is suddenly out of money. <laughs> it's um, uh, you know, you, to some degree, I chuckle at it because it's all staged. It's all being staged for a reason um, uh, to to combine the two funds together, and I'll get to that in just a second. But it's all being staged. And and the sad thing about it is the media is buying the staging. Hook, line, and sinker. They're not even they're not even peeking a little bit behind the curtain and saying, "Hey, what happened to that eight billion dollars? Uh, what happened to that four billion dollars that was originally for uh, for inflation proofing that uh, that didn't get all consumed, and then all of a sudden the balance of it went into uh, uh, went into the, the corpus? And what happened to the other four billion dollars that uh, uh, that was supposed to be uh, that was supposed to be for inflation proofing? It's it's all staged, Michael, and it's. And it, and it and it's really frustrating when you when you look at it uh, uh, from that perspective, seeing what they're doing, uh, and and the media not not examining it at all. Here's what's really going on: they want to consolidate the two funds together, and so they've and when when they think they've got an opening, they've staged the the crisis to be able to do that. Um, and and why do you want to consolidate the two funds? Why do you want to consolidate the corpus and the earnings reserve? Well, that's because. They're concerned they're going to take money out of the earnings reserve faster than it gets replenished from the corpus. That's because they're concerned that the corpus isn't going to produce the 5% return, sufficient returns to cover the draw that is set up under the POMV statute uh, to take uh, to take the money out. So, so what what's the what's the real concern? The real concern is they're not going to have enough money in the earnings reserve to cover the draw. And oh my God! And then we're going to have to talk about taxes, right? On the top twenty percent. So this is all being staged in order to set up a situation where you can continue dodging taxes by by 
saying that you're taking that 5%, even knowing that the corpus isn't producing enough to, to, to fund the 5%, say that you're taking the 5%, uh, you're limiting yourself to just that 5%, but you start eating away at the corpus uh, in order to avoid taxes. There's, there's another way to do this um, that, again, the media hasn't dived into, which is to reduce the draw. If you're concerned that the corpus isn't going to produce 5%, which is to reduce the draw down to 4.5% or 4% or, or whatever you're, you're comfortable with that the, that, the, that the reserve is going to produce, that the corpus is going to produce in terms of, of earnings. But you don't want it, but they don't want to do that because, again, that would lead to one of two things. It would either lead to pressure for spending cuts or it would lead to pressure for taxes. And they and they don't want to go down either. The legislature doesn't want to go down either of those roads. So the so the the, the permanent fund board is becoming a willing uh, participant in this charade to stage uh, this crisis and then to suggest a solution to the crisis that enables uh, spending to continue and and taxes to be avoided. All the while saying, "Oh, but we're limiting our take to just to just five percent." It's a it's a. It, <laughs> It, it, it for somebody who goes to a lot of theater, it is a well managed play uh, that we're seeing a Kabuki theater in front of us, uh, as opposed to anything real. And which, I and, and the part of with it, which has a lot of moving parts, right? Because this is in concert with the uh, the Senate Finance Committee and everything else, the movement of all this money and everything, and it's all just timed perfectly to to say, oh, look at what, the, and again completely james brooks who's usually you know pretty good about this stuff he's totally forgotten about the four billion and the and the eight billion he's totally forgotten about all these other nobody's asking the question what happened to all that money oh people are asking the question but he's just he's just not reporting on it and people in the legislature yeah. and people exactly. in the legislature are not asking the question yeah it's uh it's it's frightening so does to you does this look like a foregone conclusion that this is just what they're going to do and we're going to be it, it's going to we're going to be tooled on this? No, it's a it, it takes a constitutional amendment. So they're going to have to go through the process in the legislature and then bring it out to the public. Of course, uh, it, since it benefits the oil companies in the top twenty percent who want to avoid taxes, the push for it will be well funded, uh, and we may end up there. But but there's a lot of steps between now and then. And uh, and hopefully, uh, what's really going on, the stage managing that's going on, will will become apparent at some point, uh, and uh, and 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 people will react to that. I mean, I'm going to continue talking about it. I'm going to continue writing about it. Hopefully, others do as well. And uh, and 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 hopefully, it won't uh, won't go through. But that's just that's just one thing that they're doing that that is is typifies the politicized board. Uh, tip the politicization of the board that, that's happened. The second is uh, is this proposal to do borrowing that they're going to borrow. Now it's five percent. Used to be ten percent, uh, but now they're going to borrow five percent of the fund and right. have that have, have have that in a reserve. Um, they say they have it. They're going to have it in a reserve uh, in order to uh, in order to. I think the latest excuse is to cover cash calls. If they have a cash call uh, on one of their investments, one of their private side investments, and uh, and they need additional cash, uh, it's going to cover that. This goes back. This whole concept of borrowing, at least in my memory, goes back to an op-ed that Alice Rogoff uh, uh, wrote back in back during the Walker administration. Administration, I want to say 2017, 2016, that proposed borrowing by the uh, permanent fund board as a bar borrowing by the permanent fund as a way of expanding the size of the permanent fund and right. generating additional returns. Now, now it was a bad idea then, but it's even a worse idea now. Back then, the cost of borrowing was like two percent, and so what you were what you told yourself was, "I'm going to get a six percent or seven percent equity return on the on the investments I make off this additional money." Um, and, and I'm only going to, my cost of borrowing is only going to be 2%. There's transaction fees. So let's say the total cost is 3%. I'm going to make a 4% return, uh, off the, off this additional money that, uh, that I've, that I've borrowed. Uh, and that was, that was the story back then. Now the cost of, 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 of financing is above 4%. I mean, the, the treasury bonds, 10, 20 and 30 year treasury bonds out there are all above 4%. Um, and so the, the cost of borrowing is going to be a lot higher. 
And what, what you've always got to be concerned about in these proposals and what private equity firms who do this are always concerned about is you've got to be dead certain that the, that the, or else willing to take the, the hit that the, that the, the equity uh, investments you're making off of this borrowed money uh, are going to produce those returns. If one or two of them go bad and your overall return is, let's say, three and a half percent or three point seven five percent against a cost of borrowing of four percent or five percent by the time you add in fees, you're you're going to you're going to be going backwards. You're going to be you're going to be losing money off of right. uh, off of this. And right. And, and so but it's it, it's all set up. I mean, it's they, they want to go into the board wants to get to this hundred billion dollar mark, you know, the one that Ellie Rogoff talked about over in Saudi Arabia. They want to get to the, they want to get to, you know, be in the game, be in the be, be one of the big boys. Um, and it's all set up in this, in this, you know, grasp at, at trying to get to this, to this hundred billion dollar level. Let me tell you what the board did before the permanent fund did before we got into this situation, before we got, had people talking about this and people who have been in the oil industry listening to the show will, 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 uh, will know this term and understand this term. The board high graded its investments. If they wanted to make an investment in something in, in a new uh, project, or if they wanted to, if they had to meet a cash call in a project they liked, they sold the 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 assets that were at the bottom of the re, of the return projections. Uh, you high graded, you moved up. Um, if you wanted something new, if you wanted a new toy, you had to take a, an existing toy out of the out of the the toy shed and. Um, or the toy box and uh, and make room for the new toy. And that's, you know, all companies do that. Investment firms do that. So sovereign wealth funds do that. Everybody does that. And it's, it's an accepted part of the business. That's what our guys, that's what the, that's what the permanent fund corporation did at high graded. And, and that is a safe and secure as much safer than going out and getting debt is a safe and secure way of, you know, improving your assets um, along the way and improving your returns along the way. Now they don't want to high grade, uh, or they want to well, they want to reduce the amount of the, the high grade, and they want to go out and borrow this money so they can avoid high grading, uh, avoid you know getting the bottom of the barrel um, uh, in order to uh, by by using debt by by keep funding things all the things they have in the toy box add a new toy without having to take a toy out of the out of the out of the toy box. And so the analysis you do in that situation is you look at the thing at the bottom of the barrel and say, is the thing at the bottom of the barrel earning a better return than the debt cost? Because that's the trade-off. You either get rid of the thing at the bottom of the barrel or you or or you uh, or, or you're, you you know, expand you expand the barrel by by bringing on debt. And I will I will bet that they've got things that are sitting at the bottom of their toy box at the bottom of the barrel that aren't earning an, an above 4% return. And so what, what all they're doing is they're not really financially thinking about this financially. They're thinking about, let's get to a hundred billion dollars. Let's, let's, you know, let's grab for the brass ring and add in additional right. capital. Uh, just like Alice did in the 20, in the 2016 editorial, let's, let's grab for the brass ring and, you know, get additional, get additional funding here. And let's see if we can, let's see if we can pull it off. It's not what the permanent fund's done in the past. It's not what the permanent fund was set up to do. They were set up to be a safe and secure way of growing Alaska's assets. And they're turning it into something else. It was not what? It's not Rubenstein's little toy that she wants to ship prove that she can do the $100 million thing? That's, uh, you know. Here's the third thing. And this is sort of the key uh, to me of, of what's going on. In the governor's supplemental budget, not much in there. But but one of the things that's one of the things that that's in there is an is an appropriation, an additional appropriation of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to the Alaska Permanent Fund for get this, a global communications plan. The corporation is seeking a partnership with a global communications contractor to enhance their global presence with the goal of increasing opportunities for recruitment and investments. It's 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 Ellie Rubenstein's, you know, and and Jason uh, 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 Bruni and and Adam Crumb's, you know, political fund. It's to get their profile up. Uh, so Ellie, you know, looks big in the in the investment community. Jason and Adam can look big as they as they plot their runs for governor. Uh, we don't need 
a global communications specialist uh, to uh, to build up uh, the permanent fund. It's done. It's done just fine. So what what we see going on here is the politicization of the of the of the permanent fund. Constitutional amendment to take care of the top twenty percent, so they don't have to worry about taxes anymore. Oil companies. Right. All my friends are fine. Borrowing in order to expand the scope. To, to grab for the brass ring and then a global communications plan to tell everybody how great we are. Sounds like a, sounds like a hot mess is what it sounds like. I mean, it's, I mean, to, to be for global, what for global, what a hundred thousand, one hundred fifty thousand dollars hundred fifty thousand hundred fifty thousand dollars for a global communications plan, seeking a partnership with a global communications contractor to enhance, enhance, the Permanent Fund Board's global presence with the goal of increasing opportunities for recruitment and investments. <laughs> as if as if people who want financing for projects don't know their way to Juno already. Now we gotta tell now we gotta have a global communications plan so we can tell them, you know, what the what the way is to Juno. That's a fancy way of saying, look at me, look at me. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's exactly what it is. Oh my gosh. And of course, they're going to get it, right? <clears throat> they're going to get it because that's... Uh, well, they've, they've convinced yeah. the governor. They've convinced the governor, Mike Dunleavy, governor, I'm going to cut costs. I'm going to cut spending. I'm going to control spending. They've convinced the governor to include it in his supplemental budget. I mean, it's, I, you know, I, either either Dunleavy's just, you know, checked out entirely or I don't know. He's, he's going to support Crum or Bruni and they're in their run for governor or Ellie's convincing that there's, you know, a pot of gold. I don't know what's going on, but it's just, but it's just one more brick in the wall to help you see what's going on with the, with this permanent fund board. As I, as I've said on previous shows, I think we ought to, we ought to restructure the permanent fund board. They've, they've gone off the edge. Uh, the fact they're all gubernatorial employees. Uh, the fact there's no real criteria on, on making them investment uh, uh, gurus, uh, it's or selecting ele- investment gurus, it's just. I mean, it, it's it's the politicization of of the sixty billion to seventy billion dollar fund, um, and there's <laughs> and they're just rolling along and they're making up their stories and they're plotting and they're eight billion dollars. Oh, that's our money now. Forget that. You know that wasn't yeah. for yeah. It's just, I mean, it's it's just it's just a theater. And if you understand the game, as I say, it's almost it's a comedy. It's almost it's almost humorous to see the way they're plotting it out. But but it's it's serious business. It is, and it's frustrating to watch. And what's more frustrating, as you said earlier, is folks like uh, James Brooks and others are not asking these questions. Are not asking these questions about what's going on. And why are they, you know, uh, why are we at this position um, that we're being, we're being toyed with? I mean, we're, 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 again, I think your term use of the word toy box was not a, was not a bad choice because that's what it feels like. The rich and wealthy are using us as just kind of the toys to, you know, Ellie, Ellie Rubenstein wants to, you know, Hey. I, I can uh, look at, look at me, look at me. I've got a hundred million, a hundred billion dollar toy. I can do it. I uh, yes, I can. I can girl power, you know, watch me, watch me go. And, uh, and, hey, that, and that's what and, it's about. And mom had this idea. My brilliant business person, yeah. mother had this idea yeah. <laughs> of going out and borrowing a bunch of money to do it. I mean, yeah. come on. Brilliant. I, brilliant. It, it's, you, we we got along for however, however many years, 35 years, 38 years, whatever whatever period of time it's been, fine with the permanent fund board acting like a true, you know, investment board. Now we got them, you know, now we got these characters in there who are playing games, wanting to promote their political agendas, wanting to promote their personal, you know, profiles and their personal agendas, probably on Instagram someplace, um, you know, out there, out there, look at $100 billion. Remember, yeah. remember that? You remember that picture of the of, of Trump's secretary of the treasury and his wife at the at the at the money printing uh, 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 place in, in Philadelphia? You know, looking at all these rolls of of dollars. Oh, yeah, the mint. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. And it, this, this is sort of like Ellie. You know, I got a hundred billion dollars. <laughs> Look at me with my hands on a hundred billion dollars. 
No, it's insane. And then the worst part was, is like Dermot Cole said, I mean, they basically were, they were saying, oh, that's not what we, we didn't really want to do that. We didn't really want to. All right, well, let's get to number two. Moving on to number two of the weekly top three, which is the fact that, my God, we actually agreed with Larry Persilli on something. I think the earth just, just stuttered screech to a halt it's amazing um i agreed with about 98 percent of this article brad i was really shocked uh that that was what was going on but hit me hit me with it here what do we got so larry it, in one of his periodic columns uh has an op-ed in the anchorage daily news the title of it is alaska lawmakers shouldn't empty the pocket that feeds us and normally you would think that'd be about permanent fund earnings um and and it is in a way but what he's really talking about is the CBR, the Constitutional Budget Reserve, um, and and he's he's referencing a uh, a discussion that occurred in Senate Finance, I think it was Senate Finance, uh, between the Dunleavy administration's new OMB director and the and the committee. It was Senate Finance because it was Burt on the other side of this discussion uh, about the the Dunleavy administration's comfort in taking the CBR which once held $12 billion, $13 billion, $14, $15 billion, somewhere in that neighborhood, uh, taking the CBR down to $500 million uh, in order to cover uh, the deficit uh, that uh, uh, this year's deficit that uh, the Dunleavy, that the Dunleavy's proposed budget uh, has out there. Um, and, and the exchange was, uh, the exchange went along the lines of, well, I thought you said before, this is sort of Bert talking. I thought you said before that, we really should keep $2 billion in the, in the CBR, which again is down from the 12, $13 billion that it, that it was at one point and would have been higher if you would have kept it because it would have kept earning returns. Um, uh, I thought you've said before, we ought to keep, keep about $2 billion. Well, and the response was, well, yeah, but you know, <laughs> that'd be nice, but, but we can probably scrape along at $500 million. And, and, Personally's concern is is a valid one. A five hundred million dollars may not be enough if we have an earthquake, if we have any sort of if if we have the oil pipeline cut off like we did when was that nineteen ninety six or two thousand six or something. If we have the two thousand six, if we have the pipeline cut off uh, for a while and the cash flow from royalties and uh, and production taxes would uh, would stop for a while, or we have an earthquake, or we have any sort of a bad situation. We don't have cash reserves anymore sitting around to be able to tide us through. Uh, we would at that point essentially have to go the only savings account and it's not a savings account. The only account that would have any cash in it is the earnings reserve account. We'd have to go hit the earnings reserve account for more than the 5% in order to, in order to cover us. Um, and so it's, and so that $500 million is not enough. Uh, you can't find, you wouldn't really be able to find any economist or any accountant that would tell you that that $500 million is enough to, to you know, to, to, to sit there as a reserve for a state the size of Alaska with uh, with Alaska's, you know, uh, potential problems uh, to, to use that, to have that as the size of the reserve. So Larry's column is really, you know, taking the administration to task for that. I agree with that. 100%. It, it is, it is unbelievable, unbelievable to think that we would have an administration that would take the CBR that was one down once at, you know, 12 to $15 billion to have, take it down uh, to $500 million and think that would be acceptable. Wow. But I go one step farther than that. We have an obligation, a constitutional obligation to pay back I was just going to say, where's the, where's the comment? Where is the, there's a mandate to have $10 billion in that account. Where is the, where's the discussion on the constitutional requirement for that? There's not a single word in there on it. And, and, and the, and the whole, the whole thing that's going on and it's, and it's sort of shameful to say this for, from as a, as a member of this generation, but the whole thing that's going on is this generation is using up all of the reserves, the financial reserves. We used up the SBR, that was gone in, a, in, in almost a heartbeat. 
we've we've drained the CBR over the course of the 20 teens and into the tw early 2020s, uh, all to make our life easier, all to make our life to avoid taxes, to avoid or to avoid spend spending cuts, one of the two, all to make our life so that we could have everything we wanted in terms of spending and not have to pay for it in terms of in, at least the top 20 percent not have to pay for it middle and lower income Alaska families have through PFD cuts, but not, but not have to pay for it. We could have free goods uh, uh, all along this time and personally makes the point. And I think, you know, I would just jump up and down on this point as I guess I'm going to do right now. I would just jump up and down on this point and say, look, it's not, it, 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 it is, it is unethical for this generation to drain all of those reserves and not even have a plan to uh, of how to refill them. You know, I've written a few columns and we've had a few discussions on this show that when I when I do a budget, I add in a line for CBR repayment. And 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 it says, you know, this is amortizing the payback of the of the CBR over 10 years, 15 years. Pick a number. It ought to be shorter than that, but let's pick a number in order to put future generations who are going to have as many financial problems as we have had in order to put future generations in the same position from the standpoint of fiscal reserves as we have enjoyed ourselves uh, from the early 20 teens on and have that payback be on an amortization schedule, not even including interest. I mean, forget the interest, just on an amortization schedule to pay back the principal over some period of time. I early in Dunleavy's administration, I, I trolled that out as an idea and it was just like, what? You're, are you crazy? Right. We're not going to pay that back. Why would we ever pay that back? We're just going to live the additional draws on it. Well, that's turned out to be false too. Well, I mean, again, how do we ignore the constitution? How do we just say, well, I would just, we'll just keep kicking that can down the road. The most, the most interesting thing in that whole thing, by the way, was the fact where she acknowledges the uh, the new finance director, Lacey Sanders, uh, OMB director, says she acknowledges we also recognize the states in a position right now where we do not have a fiscal plan. You think <laughs> you think I mean, that's the first time they said the quiet part out loud. But you think you have not I mean, come on. Really? Really? Oh, they do have a fiscal plan. The fiscal plan is to keep spending and and keep having middle and lower income Alaska families pay for it through PFD that's cuts. Right. That's what and, Gary. Uh, said. That's what Gary said. Remember, he said, "Well, the seventy five twenty five is the fiscal plan." Okay, <laughs> okay. But All even right. with even with that, you get out five years, and and you can't sustain that at the level of spending that's that's projected by legislative finance, which probably has the best clue yeah. about about where spending levels are going of uh, of anybody you can't even sustain 25 75 they'll be coming back and saying oh well you don't really need 25 percent. you need like 750 dollars aren't like a senior bonus right what what we really need now is just is just the senior bonus. you don't really need any longevity yeah let's just do it and and it's just i i but but personally is right i mean and 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 we are just killing not only ourselves ultimately ourselves in the next five or ten years we are we are horrible doing horrible things to future generations. You know, people talk about being Christians and, you know, talk about being, you know, that, that we're ethical and we're moral and we're doing all these things that 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 that, you know, is is, is justified. We're, you know, giving giving transferring money to the poor. We're, you know, setting up all these programs. Yeah, well, what about what about, you know, the, the big one, which is providing for the people that come after? Oh yeah, well we're not worried about them. Yeah, we're, we're just gonna we're just gonna take all their money and 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 when they and when they get in control, we'll go surprise. Look at look at the look at the cash box moths moths fly out. <laughs> or no, there's a due there's a bill due in the cash box. <laughs> it's like it's a it's a thing. It's a statement of debt. Here you go. Here's your payment plan. I can't believe how irresponsible we're being with respect to future generations. I mean, it yes, it's a strain. It's a strain to pay as you go. It's a strain to be financially responsible, not run the bank account up or not run the the, the debt costs up. It's a strain to live within your means. Um, and but you know, the legislature, in, in its infinite wisdom, has decided it doesn't. It doesn't want to live within its means. It wants to, you know, spend on all these programs. It wants to add additional programs on top of those. And 
and uh, and not tax you know all Alaskans, only tax uh, the middle and lower income Alaskans. It's just it, it's it, this this typifies this typifies how bad this legislature and the legislatures over the last 10 years and the administrations over the last 10 years, not to pick on Dunleavy alone, but to certainly pick on him because he's continuing the trend that, uh, that Sean Parnell started and that, that Bill Walker continued. And now Mike Dunleavy uh, has continued. It is one constant slide as, as you, as you can look at the CBR amount, you see that slide going as one constant slide into the abyss. And now we're right at the tip. It's sort of like a slide. Yeah. And now we're at the tip of the slide and we're just about to skate off, you know, into the, into the, right into the Canyon. <laughs> it's like one of those big water slides where you're like, no, 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 no. Too late. There you go. You're going down. There you go. Um, it's, uh, <clears throat> I mean, this is, this is just crazy. And again, the fact that they acknowledge that there is no plan, there is nothing else. We're just going to keep, um, we're just going to keep going and we're not going to pay back the money that we're constitutionally obligated to, to pay. We'll just keep pushing that off. Are you crazy? Why would we amortize that out? We don't want to do that. It's just, um, I, it, I, it's insane. I, I it's still, re I still remember the discussion I had with people in the Dunleavy campaign about that. It was like, I mean, they just stared through me. It was sort of like, we're never going to do that. Why would we do that? We may get to a point where we can do it someday, but but we're not going to we're not going to amortize it. We're not going to you know admit the re, the liability and the responsibility that this generation has to future generations. Hell no, we're not going to do that. And now you know they've made it worse, and now they're making it even worse. You know, even Walker sort of said we're going to stop at two billion. Now he, he that's what he that's when he still had a lot of money and he could say two billion relatively easily. Now that we're at two billion or less than two billion, now we're saying five hundred million. Come on, if yeah. We, if we if we have an earth a major earthquake or if we have an interruption of that oil pipeline, we are in deep, huge, massive problems. Right, because what's the average supplemental budget? Somewhere between two and three hundred million dollars. Now you add some kind of crisis on top of that, you got another couple hundred million. That your 500 million is gone with the wind, right? I mean, it's like, you know, just on a supplemental budget that may come around the next year, you have no idea. 500 million is a, is a drop in the ocean. Yeah. And, and, and next year, you know, I fully expect next year is going to be, well, we could, we, we've, we've analyzed it now. We can skate by on 250 million. I mean, it's just, I, it, this, this just keeps going down and it keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And, and this administration has done nothing to make it better. In fact, they've made it worse. The legislature, this legislature has done nothing to make it better. In fact, they've made it worse. And, and personally, it's the right to call them out. Uh, call all of them out. Uh, the minority, the majority, the governor, everybody. Call them all out for the, uh, for the situation that they've, uh, that they've created. We couldn't do that. I mean, what, what about the Constitution? I would just, we, we couldn't do that. What is the answer? I mean, I just, the thing is, is that nobody wants to, nobody wants to pony up uh, and be responsible for what we've done in the past. No, this is not all the Dunleavy administration's fault. The Parnell administration was the one that spent, you know, $10 billion during their tenure. Uh, but I mean, and the Walker administration did and everything, but at some point somebody has got to go, whoa, Hey, we got to pay this money back. This is the this is the answer to what's going on, right, Brad? Yeah, exactly. And 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 Dunleavy. I mean, the reason that Dunleavy comes in for some criticism on this is that Dunleavy said we're going to be different. Dunleavy ran against Walker. Walker for ran against Walker for re-election, saying we're going to be different. We're going to do this stuff differently. We're going to we're going to be fiscally responsible. We're going to be financially, you know, uh, accountable for uh, for for how we for how we run government. Um, and we're going to, you know, we're going to, we're going to rebuild, uh, rebuild Alaska, Alaska's fiscal situation from the, from the, from the state in which he found it. He's made it worse. He's he, Alaska's fiscal situation has continued to go South, uh, during the Dunleavy administration. Now, you know, the legislature certainly has a, has a big share of, of, of accountability or responsibility for, for that as well. But the Dunleavy administration itself has made it worse. His own budget proposals uh, have have made it worse. His signing the budgets that the legislature has approved 
uh, has made it worse. His failure to include some sort of amortization for the CBR. I mean, you know, pick 20 years. I don't care exactly what the number is, but pick some amortization period where you're going to put future generations back in the position that, that we found that we were, you know, found ourselves in, in the early 20 teens, where we had all this pot of cash that we could sort of ride out what we thought was going to be a temporary wave, at least, you know, have some plan for how you're going to put future generations back in the same position. We don't, we don't, we don't have any amortization plan for repaying the CBR. Right. And, and the constitutional problem is, yes, we have an obligation to repay the CBR, but there's no schedule set forth in the C in the constitution for how soon you have to pay it back. So everybody goes, well, I'll do that tomorrow. I'll get to that. Tom well, tomorrow came and went <laughs> a few years ago. And now, and now we're just beyond the, we're beyond the looking glass someplace. We've been underneath the $10 billion mark for 10 years and we haven't paid back. I mean, our, we don't have a plan to pay back anything at this point. So, I mean, at some point you got to ask questions like what? I mean, <laughs> Are we are we really planning or are we just going to ignore? Is this going to take another one of those lawsuits where you go to the Supreme and you sue the state to say they've got to pay it back and you got to go to court and say the Constitution says this. What's the deal? I mean, you know, is that what it's going to take to get them to acknowledge that there's a liability or do they just do the courts just say, well, it says you have to pay it back, but it doesn't give you a time frame. So you can't sue them right now over it. I mean, what you know. That's what the court would say. The court would say it's in the infinite wisdom of the legislature. And hey, guys, you elect the legislature. So, you know, as, as Kevin McCabe said in, a, in, a, in an exchange we had, uh, it's really the voters' fault. It's not really the legislator's fault. It's really the voters' fault for who they, set, who they sent to the legislature. No, come on. Come on. Legislators have an obligation to lead, right? They have a responsibility to actually see issues uh, they're in a position to see issues. They have a responsibility to see issues. And they have a responsibility to talk about it. If, even if they can't do anything about it, even if they're outvoted, at least the ones who see it have a responsibility to, to talk about it, hold hearings on it, you know, take their, their special order time at the end of the, at the end of each session to talk about it and, and hopefully get on the, on the chart with the, with the media. Uh, but we don't, we don't even do that. It's just, you know, it's some. It's somebody. This state has become great at finger pointing, right? It's not my fault. It's the voters' fault. It's not my fault. It's the legislature's fault. It's not my fault. It's the governor's fault. It's always somebody else's fault. And and we don't have, you know, Governor Dunleavy promised in 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 2018 to be the one to stand up and say halt to all this and and reverse it. But we don't have anybody who's really done that. I mean, we've got right. we've got people who talk about it occasionally, but nobody has really stood up to do it. Uh, Kevin says it's 21, 11 and one, Brad, that's the answer. I mean, he's not wrong. Uh, and, it, Kevin, and, it, my, and my response to that is Kevin, take your special order time for the next two weeks and talk about this issue and, and get on the radar by talking about this issue. Yeah. And, and you, and you, and I know you chair transportation and I know it's sort of tough to shoehorn this into transportation, but but do something to create a hearing on this issue in transportation. We, we can't fi finance future transportation if we don't solve this problem. You've got you've got tools that you can use to be able to publicize this issue. It's an important issue because it's going to come back. And the the worst thing is is that this will come back and bite us at the worst time. You know what I mean? It'll be like the worst time when we really. It, you know, one way or the other, it'll bite us because we don't have the money or it'll bite us because we have to put the money in regardless of what happens. Let's continue on here. Brad Keithley, Alaska's for Sustainable Budgets, the final of the weekly top three, uh, the big three, and that is the defined benefits plan. It has become, as Brad says, the perver proverbial, proverbial, the proverbial pig in a poke. Uh, Brad, give me, give me your thoughts on this here. What are we talking about? Well, Tim Bradner did a, uh, did an article for the frontiersman that, that talked about the three issues, uh, that he thought were the big issues that were remaining on the table, education, pensions, uh, and energy. Fiscal plan is not among them. <laughs> forget, forget about that. We're let's deal with something else since we can't deal with fiscal plan, uh, education, pensions, and energy and pensions. Uh, it, it pensions is just sort of it's just one of those issues that just really galls me. I mean, 
Um, so the Senate's passed a bill, and and the bill's over in the House for the House to consider. It's in, I think it's still in the subcommittee that uh, that Craig Johnson uh, uh, created uh, to consider it. Um, and and so we've got a bill that's that's over in the House. But here's the deal about that bill, and I know I know you've talked about it on the show before, but it just really it just really lights me up when I when I think about this. So there was a fiscal note about this bill that was done in accordance with usual procedures and um, in in 2013, in the 2013 session, done in accordance with usual procedures and published and and showed that this bill could cost the state quite a bit. What they did with that fisc, what they did with that analysis just drives me up a wall. this This is the new fiscal note that replaced the old fiscal note. This is what they say. The previous version of this fiscal note was derived from an analysis provided by the Department of Revenue and Benefits Consulting Actuary. You know, the one who actually deals with this stuff on a regular basis. Buck's analysis indicated two separate impacts on future state budgets, direct costs for state employees and additional state contributions to municipal and school direct uh, employees in excess of the statutory minimum maximum contribution levels. And it showed that this was going to and that fiscal note showed uh, that there was going to be a, a, pro- a problem with that. Next paragraph. Buck is in the process of revisiting this analysis, basically because finance didn't like it, basically because Kathy Giesel and finance didn't like it. Given both updated workforce data as well as the changes made in the Senate Finance Committee substitute, because this analysis will not be available for several weeks, <laughs> because it takes actuaries a while to do these things, the Finance Committee is producing their own fiscal note with the input and assistance of the committee's own contract actuary. It is understood and expected the committee's fiscal note will be superseded once the buck analysis, in other words, once we've had them in the back room and beat them up enough so that they produce one that we like, once the buck analysis is complete. Additionally, the committee had concerns with the prior buck analysis because of the way it incorporated future changes to the workforce. And it goes on and on and on about how this old fiscal note uh, done by the people that normally do fiscal notes, how this old fiscal note just it wasn't what we wanted. So we had our consultant come in and do one. And that's what we're going to, and that's what we're going to pass this bill on. We have no clue. We honestly have no clue using, using somebody other than the committee's own consultant. We have no clue uh, about what, uh, about what this, this, this is going to cost because we essentially took the people who who normally do the fiscal notes on these things and took them in a back room and are beating them up until they until they come up with the with the, with the answer we want. And and you know I, I looked up the definition of pig in a poke and, and it fits it perfectly. We don't know what this sucker is going to cost. We know what Senate Finance, what the Senate Finance Committee's consultant that they retained to do to to replace Buck. We know what they think it's going to cost, but I have no faith. That the that the committee's consultant, uh, uh, after they trashed uh, the old, after they trashed their existing consultant, after the committee's consultant came up with a number, I have no faith that uh, that uh, that they that the number is uh, that the number is any good. Tellingly, tellingly, on the floor of the Senate, two of the three finance committee co-chairs voted against the bill. Right, and they said, "Whoa, whoa, wait a second, this is not, yeah." This this is and here's the thing that we've seen this in the past. I mean, and actuarials matter, folks, by the way, that's how we got so upside down in that first defined benefits program is we had actuarials that weren't doing the job right or they were they were mismanaging it and they weren't doing the right thing. That's how we ended up so upside down in our previous defined benefits program. So I'm assuming that this actuarial was taking all that into account when he wrote this first one. And then they're like, no, 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 this is way too high. So we're going to hire our own consultant to come in who's going to tell us what we want. I mean, this is just, you know, this is insane. And where is that second report? It's been six weeks, seven weeks. Where is this second report that that keeps saying that it's going to come out? I mean, do we have to pass it before we figure out what the thing is going to cost? Is that the deal? They're waiting to drop it the minute that the ink is dry on the bill? I mean, what's going on? Yeah, I well, hopefully, hopefully that's hopefully the House is going to be responsible in this regard and and not uh, not pass it out uh, uh, in uh, uh, with, without without a fiscal note. But it's just, I mean, it's just so, so you know the press is full of the press is full of Senate passed it out, 
oh my God, you know, this is part of the solution to retaining people. Kathy Giesel, the new Kathy Giesel, I'm not sure what happened to the old Kathy Giesel, but the new Kathy Giesel is out there touting that, you know, we needed to retain workforce. We needed to retain teachers. We needed, you know, we just need it. And um, yeah, I, I thought often, did did Vince Bel Beltrami actually win that that race against Kathy and, and just, <laughs> just, put on, just yeah. put on Kathy? or something but it's but it's uh it, it's it, it, i mean this is Giesel out there selling this and and you have an actuarial report that isn't what you want so you just replace the actuary and 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 come in with another actuary this is the classic definition of pig in a poke we don't know what we're getting and we know the senate's passed it although the two two of the three uh senate finance committee chairman their co-chairman voted against it we we the senate passed it they wanted to get it out and this stuff matters because, because as, as even Gary Stevens, the president of the Senate, admitted, look, you know, once we pass this, we set up a constitutional claim uh, against the permanent fund for the results. I mean, the Constitution uh, includes a provision that says that, that, it is, that, that, you know, retirement benefits to public employees are constitutionally guaranteed. So once you pass this, once you create this tier, you can't roll it back. By by new statutes, it it is it takes on constitutional protections, and and we can't undo it. I mean, we can create a new tier for those going forward, but we can't undo those that are that those that will fall into this tier. And this tier goes back and captures all of the people who have been under defined contribution by giving them the opportunity to opt in uh, to the defined benefit plan. So we're we're about to you know if this bill would pass. We would scoop up all those people in the past that we had under defined contribution, dump them into this defined benefit plan, and then put a constitutional protection around this defined benefit plan going forward. And, we, and, and, we're, and we're doing all this, or the Senate passed a bill that does all this without knowing what the numbers are, with, with only knowing numbers that their own consultant came up with. So it's just, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a, you know, you wonder how we... You wonder how we got into this situation. This may be the, you know, if you were ever going to write a story for how Alaska killed yeah. itself, this, this is may, a, be the, may be the first yeah. paragraph. This is exactly it. This is the this is the uh, the case study for how we submarined our own future right here. Just watching this stuff, Brad, it's just it's so painful to just watch the the it, it, like this defined benefits thing. Yes, of course, we have to pass it to figure out how much it's going to cost. You are going to constitutionally guarantee a multi-billion dollar plan, and you have no idea what the actual costs are going to be. You've got a, you know, what did somebody said, uh, Kevin said, deep fake fiscal note. You've got a fiscal note that's made up by your own consultant, not by the people who are doing the job full time already, uh, because you didn't like the first version of that. I mean, I'm just... I, and that's just one thing. That's just the defined benefits thing. That's not everything else we've talked about today, but that's enough to just make your head explode when you think about that. Yeah, I, it, it, it is, Michael. I, we've got, we have turned into a state where everybody's out for themselves, right? Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, we're probably going down. So let me grab for the brass ring, you know, uh, uh, for myself. Uh, while while we're going down, let me let me you know get one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to hire a global consultant, global communications consultant, so I can look good as I get ready to to run for governor, or as I get ready to uh, you know go on the speaking tour in Saudi Arabia again. Uh, you know, let me let me borrow a bunch of money. Don't make me high grade. Don't make me make choices. Don't make me do my job. Just give me a bunch more money to to borrow so that I can you know just keep keep building. You know, say I'm building this fund, if it, and if and if it all comes down, well, you know, I'll just go off to something else. It's just it, we've we've got a state. I mean, you can see this with the PFD. You can see it with with the CBR. We've got a state where everybody's out for themselves. We've taken this individualism that we prize here to to the nth degree, to beyond the beyond the edge of the edge of the of the pale pale. And, and we've got people who are just grabbing for, you know, whatever they can get as they go. It's in the legislature, you know, with, with all these programs, you know, we got teachers. <laughs> people talk about all company representatives in the legislature and how bad it is they're voting on, uh, voting on uh, oil uh, tax bills. 
Uh, well, we got teachers in the legislature <laughs> that are voting on on K through 12 bills, non defined benefits. We got legislators in the legislature voting on their own 67 percent pay raises for those who are about to retire. I mean, uh, come on. Man. We got leg- we got legislators who have put themselves all into the top twenty percent, who are voting. You know who are who are voting on. Do we tax me or do we tax middle and lower income Alaska families? Oh, I got an idea. Let's tax middle and lower income Alaska families. Don't t- don't touch me, because because my donors would be all upset about that. It's it, everybody. We've we, we've taken individual individualism to the point where everybody's just grabbing for a little bit for themselves, and it's just I it's. It, it's disgusting. It's disappointing. It's unethical. I mean, look if 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 you're a 20 year old today listening to this program, you're getting stuck with the bill. We've drained the CBR down. We're not paying the CBR back. In about 10 years' time, as Michael says, we're going to open the money box, and there's just going to be there's not going to be money in there, like you know this generation had back in the early 20 teens. There's going to be a bill in there. It'd be like dumb and dumber with all the IOUs. It's just like I just, you know, it... <laughs> and and it's and it's and it's become, I mean, the majority's the, the minority's doing it in the in in the in the in the house, the majority's doing it, everybody's just doing it. And and it's just and Dunleavy's doing it, you know, give me a raise, you know, increase increase the 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 pay is for for all of the you know executives and all of the boards, pay Frank Richards over. At the Alaska gas line, which isn't going anyplace, pay him four hundred fifty thousand dollars. I mean, just everybody's grabbing for a little bit for themselves as the ship's going down, and no one's saying, "Wait, the ship's going down," <laughs> and 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 we're just we're just continue going in this direction. It's. Uh... It's frustrating to watch. I mean, this is this is kind of the major frustration that you and I face because we've been talking about these things for. 10 years and they just keep, it just keeps coming back over and over and over again. And it's like, you could see the train wreck coming and you can't look away, but you know, it's, it's nobody's listening. Nobody's listening. It's called a golden parachute says Chris. And that's exactly right. That's the golden parachute. That's what everybody in government is doing right now. They're searching for that golden parachute so they can yank the, yank the cord and, and be bailed out on their way out. It doesn't matter as long as they got theirs, everybody else can do whatever they want. They got theirs on the way out and they're fine. And that's, uh, that's a sad, that's a sad state of affairs because there's a lot of us out here in the private sector who would be like, we're holding the bag on everything. Um, maybe we should have been a little more selfish, Brad. Maybe we should have been a little, <laughs> a little more. Maybe I, sh- maybe I should run for office next year and be like, I am in it for me, folks. I'm in it for me. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to get a good retirement and I'm leaving. I just wanted to let you know that. I don't plan on being there long. I plan on going in there and getting mine. So vote for me. Give me a defined benefit, by the way, on the on the on the on the way in. Yeah, it's um and and yeah, yeah. And and you know, if CBR, oh, we can get by with $250 million. Let's just take let's just take more and put it and put it into spending or put it into it'll tax, actually look good if we avoidance. borrow against it. If we borrow against it and and go into the negative, we borrow a billion dollars on that five hundred million, it'll look better on the books. So let's do that. <laughs> I'm all about that. You know, and Michael, Michael, you know, so we're going to have governor gubernatorial candidates starting the next year or so, and they're all going to say, I'm going to be different. And after Dunleavy, how do you, how do you trust even that? I just don't even know, man. I just don't even know at this point. It's, it's crazy. Brad, less than about 90 seconds here. Give us your final thoughts. Oh, my final thoughts is this legislature is going off track. Um, Not, not surprising about that, but uh but you know the administration's gone off track. The, the legislature, the legislature's going off track, uh, and the permanent fund board's going off track. And 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 we're not we're not acting responsibly anymore. We're acting in the heat of the moment to do things that we're going to look back on and and really regret. I regret them already. What do you mean looking back and regret? I regret them as they're happening. I'm just watching this going, why? Why do you do this, people? Um, well, we'll see. We'll see how prog- 
we'll see how prescient we are on this, how, how well we prognosticated on this, Brad, uh, here in the near future. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. You can find him at ak4sb.com and, of course, on Twitter and Facebook and everything else. Uh, thank you, my friend, for coming on board. We appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.